Oh, the prints there, here. Okay. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to day three of Canola Week. Got a bit of feedback here. Um, my name is Isabel Parkin. I'm from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada here in Saskatoon. And um, I'm just going to uh, go through a few logistics and information that if you haven't been here before or just as a reminder. Um, <clears throat> so we'd obviously like to thank our sponsors this year again. And um, the top sponsors this year were BASF and Bayer. And then there's a big thanks to Nutrien and Manitoba Canola Growers, SAS Canola, Cortiva and Alberta Canola. And obviously we can do this event without the support of Canadian Canola Growing Association, New Seed, Syngenta, Western Grains Research Foundation, Winfield United, John Deere and Decisive Farming by TELUS Agriculture. So thanks to all those fantastic sponsors. Um, <clears throat> And for those of you who've been here for a while, I'm sure you're very aware that there's an event app that you are encouraged to use throughout the, the meeting because it gives you access to agendas, conference attendees, and you can um, <clears throat> uh, also, you know, pick your favorite questions from the Q&A, so it gives you those options. Um, you're also encouraged to use the virtual platform, but please remember to mute your phones um, if you're doing this because we're trying to obviously limit feedback um, and for those of you that are in the room there is an agenda on the table that gives you a quick reference to who's speaking and um, the general area um, and for those of you that are collecting CCA credits for attending Canola Week the QR codes will be shown throughout the afternoon and at the end of the day so those should be available for you um, and this year, in lieu of speaker gifts, we're actually uh, donating to the Keith Downey Undergraduate Scholarship at the University of Saskatchewan, as we did last year. So that's a, <clears throat> an excellent um, uh, an excellent sponsorship. Also, we're, and I think that is most of the, of the announcements for today. So I think we're ready to get going. So this session is the um, genomics, <clears throat> advances in genetics and genomics. Um, towards canola breeding and we have four excellent talks unfortunately two of them are pre-recorded which is good and bad but it means that those speakers may not be able to um, join us because they're actually well one's in Australia one's in France so time difference is a bit of a tricky one so our first speaker of today is Jackie Batley um, from the University of Western Australia in uh, Perth <clears throat> so I've known Jackie for a long time and um, she has worked in uh, Braska Genetics and Genomics um, for as long as I have, actually. And she's a professor at the School of Biological Sciences in Western Australia. And she, her expertise is in plant microbiology and genetics. And particularly, she focuses on plant disease resistance. And so she's going to be talking about pan-genome disease resistance genes in Braska Napus. Thanks. or even do it um, as um, not a recording. But unfortunately, with the way the time zone is here, it doesn't really work to do other than this. But anyway, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present the work we're doing. And if anybody does have any questions, please feel free to contact me, and I'm happy to discuss further. So I'm going to talk today about using pan genomes to identify disease resistance genes in brassicas. that we're seeing 
a lot more prevalence of fungicides being applied here and so we want to identify the genes so that we can use this as a way of control and not keep having this reliance on the fungicides. When I talk about resistance genes today, there's a few different types of resistance genes that we try and find in the genomes. Um, most commonly, people know about these NLRs, these nucleotide binding site leucine rich repeats, and there's different ones of um, these. So, for example, the coid coil ones um, or the tol interleukin receptor ones, or they can have a variation on the number of different domains. So they can have this coiled coil or TNL, the NB arc domain, and then these leucine rich repeats. And because these are conserved, we can easily look for these within the genome. But there's also um, these transmembrane leucine rich repeats, which are receptor like proteins and receptor like kinases. And we look for those as well. Um, but these are generally can be involved in disease resistance or can be involved in other traits as well. However, finding these genes in um, brassicas is challenging. Partly this is due to the genome complexity that we have, partly because there's a large variability in the host and the pathogen um, between the different morphotypes, for example, and also that there's rapid evolution of the pathogen. And this is a big factor. The pathogen can very quickly overcome the resistance genes. So we need to make sure we've got a big armory of them so that we have enough genes for in the future to deploy if needed. So back a long time ago, when the genome was first developed, we searched for these different resistance genes within the genome. And here we're just focusing on um, what we did looking just at these NLR genes. But we these each of these gray bars is a chromosome in Brassica napus on the A genome. And each of these different colored dots is basically a different type of these resistance genes. And so we could identify these across the genome, we could see which were duplicated, for example, as um, represented by these lines, which were clustered together. And we were specifically interested in genes on chromosome A7, because we were interested in the black leg resistance genes that we knew were on that chromosome. So once we'd identified the genes within the genome and having the genome sequences really enabled us to do this, we thought this would be fantastic. We'd be able to identify the genes and move on um, being able to then deploy them and identify them within different cultivars rather than just phenotyping. So here we have an um, example of chromosome A7 and we knew from genetic mapping and looking at QTR regions, we knew the region on the chromosome where the resistance gene should be. So here, for example, we have um, the whole chromosome and then there's clusters of resistance genes, for example, RLM4, 3, 7 and 9 on um, chromosome A7. And this is just an example of the RLM9 QTL. So across the whole chromosome, we had um, approximately 60 resistance genes that we predicted. Within this big QTL, which had um, multiple black leg resistance genes in there, we had 30 resistance genes. And just within this one gene QTL, there were predicted to be 14 resistance genes. So we thought that this would really help us narrow down and be able to identify the gene. However, um, so we did short read sequencing of different cultivars that were resistant and susceptible to try and look and see what SNPs were within these resistance genes and see which of them would most likely be the candidate. Unfortunately, what we found was that within these candidate genes which we predicted, none of them had SNPs which segregated with the phenotype. So this led us to um, complain bitterly to the bioinformaticians that the genome assembly wasn't good enough and we couldn't find our genes. But it also made us think that we needed another way to be able to identify these resistance genes. We couldn't just be relying on the genome sequence as a whole. Now, since then, we've also found that obviously genome assemblies have got much, much better. And so compared to the initial assembly of um, the Brassica napus genome, which came out in 2014, there's been many iterations and other genomes published since then. Um, and what we found was that as the genome assemblies got better and got more complete, if we just list an example of a black leg QTL region, we can see that actually just within the same QTL region, there's a lot more sequence assembled in a more recent assembly, which came out in 2021, than there was in an assembly which came out in 2014. And that also means that we have many more resistance genes predicted. 
So whenever new genome assemblies come out, we need to make sure that we look in these to try and see if we can find any more candidate genes and not just rely on the old genome assemblies. But that isn't the only strategy that we can use to try and identify black leg resistance genes. And so this led us to looking at the concept of a pan genome. And the reason that we look at a pan genome is just as I am not representative of the diversity of humans, um, the reference genome sequences aren't always representative of diversity of a species. And sometimes they're picked just because they happen to be good genomic resources and not because they're actually the best um, line or cultivar to use. And so what we see in previous models, and this is what we thought, um, was that SNP in a candidate gene was what caused the difference in the phenotype. And if we just look for SNPs in the genes within the region, we should be able to find the candidate. What we see now when we look at a pan genome is that, yes, it could still be this SNPs in genes, but it could also be that the gene actually is lost in one cultivar compared to another. And this could be what's causing the difference in phenotype. And this may not only just be loss of a gene, sometimes it can be that the gene is so diverged that when you resequence different lines and try and map that data to call the different SNPs, sometimes the genes are so diverged that the reads just won't map. And we found that pan genomes do capture the wider genetic variation in brassicas. So what we see is we have these, what we call core genes, which are present in everything. They're present in all the individuals. And then for different cultivars, there's variable and dispensable genes. So these might be present in some cultivars, but not in other cultivars. And then some cultivars have unique genes. So these genes are only present in those cultivars. And we need to be able to look at all of these and not just focusing on these core genes, which we were looking at before, or maybe the core genes and the variable which are present in the reference genome to be able to look for our candidate genes. And we've made pan genomes of um, Raskin napus, but also of the diploid species. So we started off trying to be um, a little more um, conservative by going with one of the diploid genomes rather than jumping into the polyploid genome. And so we started off with Brassica oleracea. And within this, we picked a few different morphotypes of Brassica oleracea representing them. And we had two cabbages and two cauliflowers. And we also had a wild line. And we wanted to see what assembled in the pan genome. So what was different, what was core, and what was variable. And what we found was that Actually, when we looked at the types of genes which were shown to be variable in the pan genome, we found that defense genes were coming up as some of the most variable genes. And so this led us to actually do a much more detailed study to look at the variation of the predicted resistance genes in the Brassica oleracea pan genome. And um, so when we looked at this, we found that Indeed, there were quite a few extra genes coming up in the pan genome, which weren't present in the reference genome. And this, um, bear in mind in Oleracea, we only had 10, 11 different lines in there. So if you have more lines, you're going to see even more um, differences. And so you can see that, um, you know, here, for example, there was there were 79 extra receptor like kinases picked up in the um, additional pan genome context that weren't present in the reference genome. Um, and then 54 RLPs, for example. So this actually ends up as quite a big proportion. And there was an extra 260 resistance genes which came up. And um, mostly these were the MBS LRRs, of which there were 117 of them, which is covered by my um, face, some of them at the moment. Uh, we also saw that there was quite a difference in the um, different cultivars and different morphotypes, which were bringing in the different resistance genes. So for example, we could see that in cauliflowers, most of the, so um, I should explain that this graph, these are the um, extra different types of genes. So it's split up into these different um, gene classes, which were brought into the um, pan genome by adding in the assemblies from these different, and the um, genome data from these different morphotypes. So we can see that the two cabbage lines and the wild line, the macrocarpa, that actually brought in a very large proportion of the extra resistance genes which weren't present in the reference genome, whereas the cauliflower lines and the kohlrabi 
didn't bring in as many different resistance genes. So this means that it's really important to look, when you look at pan genomes, to look at the different morphotypes and many different and diverse cultivars to make sure you are capturing that diversity and all the potential candidate genes which are out there. We also did work on Brassica rapa. Um, this publication is currently um, submitted. And again, we can see um, there were a lot more lines within the Brassica rapa. Um, pan genome compared to the brassica oleracea, we had 71. But again, we had 233 extra resistance genes coming in compared to the 755 that we had before. Um, and most of these, we also had, um, we could see that many of the NLRs were variable compared to the RLPs and RLKs. So this is a vast number of extra genes that we were missing when we weren't looking at pan genomes. And this shows why it's so important to look at the pan genomes compared to just one single line. Um, and we also see something very interesting when we look at the um, genes with the resistance genes within the pan genomes. And this is an example again from Brassica rapa here, but we see this consistently across the different species that most of the resistance genes do contain SNPs, which we would expect, but there are a few which don't. But actually the SNPs in the core, there's many more SNPs on average per gene in the core gene. So this is um, that there's an average of 82 SNPs per gene in the core gene than in the variable genes. So obviously that we're seeing a different method of evolution, potentially a different method of resistance, that it's either gene loss or polymorphism, which causes this resistance and not um, both. So obviously having done this in the diploid species, we wanted to move on and see um, what things were like in the polyploid. So we did prediction in the Brassica napus pan genome. And we found that 43% of the candidate resistance genes across the genome, the pan genome, I should say, were variable. So only 56% of the genes were found in all the lines. And this was done with about 52 different cultivars. Um, again, um, we characterized them based on whether they were the NLRs, the RLPs or RLKs, and then went on to look at the distribution of them a little bit more. So we could see that some of them were on additional contexts. Um, some of them, we had more extra ones coming in on the C genome than we did on the A genome. And we found we had different um, cultivar types in here, and we found that the um, oil seed type lines that we had lost more R genes per cultivar than the synthetic cultivars that we looked at. And um, again, we found that the core genes harbored more SNPs than the variable genes, just like we found in Rapa and Oleracea. But we didn't want to just look at presence absence variation. We also wondered whether copy number variation had an impact on disease resistance genes. So we undertook a study to look at um, whether any of the resistance genes were undergoing copy number variation. So each of these different chunks here is a different chromosome of the um, NAPIS genome. So we've got the A genome and the C genome here. And then each of these, this is just a subset of the PAN genome, each of these inner circle represents a different cultivar. The different lines are different resistance genes. And where they're in blue, it's where they're showing presence absence variation. And when they're in red, it's where they're showing copy number variation. So again, we can see some of these genes show copy number variation in some cultivars compared to other cultivars. So this could be um, that it has more than one copy or it could be um, deletion. And then some of them, it's just either presence absence, so they're there or they're not. And when we look at this um, in more detail, so we looked, some of these are deletion in red, so this is per chromosome, which is what we've been looking at when we were looking in the pan genome. And some of these are duplication. So this is more than one copy of the resistance gene within different cultivars. And then sometimes we see that it's both. So sometimes we see that in one cultivar, it's not present at all. And in other cultivars, there's actually multiple copies of it. So this is a bit of an extension of this presence absence variation. There can also be duplication of some of those variable genes. So we um, also want to look and see whether this can play a role in disease resistance in canola, as well as just looking at the SNPs and the presence absence. So when we look at these in QTL regions, we see that some genes within, so this is just looking at QTL regions um, of a few different genes 
in brassica species. We see that if we look in a QTL region, for example, in black leg, 35 candidate resistance genes in there are core, but four of them are variable. Um, in this downy mildew, 17 of them are core, but 15 are variable in the different lines we look at. So we really do need to be looking at these as well, because if we just look at those core genes which are present in the reference, we could be missing out on um, potentially identifying candidate genes. So the success story of this was going back and doing some of this, looking at the pan genome and not looking um, just at the um, reference genome, helped us in finding RLM4 and RLM7. So when we were looking in the Australian lines, it was through looking at the pan genome that helped us to identify this. So we've now developed markers, CAS markers, for those published black leg resistance genes. So um, LEP R3, RLM2, RLM9, RLM4, RLM7. And then we've also got candidate genes. Through doing this, we had the success with um, RLM4 and 7. So now we're moving to extend this to other resistance genes as well. Again, looking in all these reference genomes, but looking in the pan genomes. So this is an example of um, looking at candidate resistance genes for RLM6. So we had um, some different, um, we had a QTL region. Within the QTL region that we looked at through GWAS and QTL, there were 60 candidate genes or approximately 60 candidate genes within that region. So we, through sequence analysis of resequencing again, resistance and susceptible lines, and so some of these will be core and some will be variable, we identified some strong candidate genes from that and developed um, markers. So um, we looked at some of this, looking to see whether there was segregation between um, resistant and susceptible lines. Sometimes there was some segregation of SNPs. This is a bit messy because the um, candidate gene read mapping didn't go well because it was um, quite variable compared to the um, assembly within the genome and pan genome. But other genes, we saw absolutely no SNPs between resistant and susceptible lines, so we could rule them out as candidate genes. So with these candidate genes, the ones that were strong candidates we've gone on and developed markers that are specific for the um, resistant and susceptible alleles. And this just shows an example here that when we look at the resistant allele, it amplifies up in all the resistant lines and in none of the susceptible lines. So we've got a couple of these which could make strong candidates and we can use these which we can now go on for functional validation of these genes and then use these for breeding improved canola. We've also got another candidate um, Gene, this isn't RLM6, this is another example where we've got really good segregation between resistant and susceptible genes um, lines. So we're using these to, um, again, for functional validation so that we can then develop routine markers that can be used. But we're not only interested in um, the resistance in the cultivated species, we've also done work mining resistance genes much wider across the Brassicaceae and as more um, pan genomes come out and are developed in these, we'll also be looking for candidate genes within these pan genomes and trying to identify candidate, mainly black leg resistance genes, but we are also looking at other diseases. So in summary, um, basically looking at the pan genome, we've got a very comprehensive repertoire of the R genes which are present, and we see significant numbers of these, and in Brassica napus, almost half, are affected by presence-absence variation. Um, we also found that core genes harbour more SNPs than variable R genes, um, but we see that there's a lot of variable genes co-localised with disease resistance regions, and we've seen this in our research, um, that we need to look at the pan genomes in gene identification and not just at reference genomes, because we see that we're missing out on potential candidate genes. And I'd just like to thank my team, who are actually all the ones who've been um, doing the work, and also through the funding through um, ARC and GRDC and all of my collaborators. And thank you again. I'm sorry I can't be there in person, but please do contact me if you have any questions. Thank you. Yes, of genomics and identifying markers for useful traits. 
Um, so the next speaker is a, the newest member, I guess, of the Nebraska community in, in uh, Canada. And uh, so I'm very happy to introduce Hamid Javala, who is just joined the University of Manitoba as their, uh, an assistant professor in canola genomics and bioinformatics. I've known uh, Hamid for quite a while now. He was at the University of Gießen in Germany, and then he moved on to Saskatoon, actually, where he was working at the CDC with Curtis Posniak. And um, looking forward to his talk, which is going to talk about genomics assisted breeding in Braska Napus. Here we go. Hi, uh, good morning. Thank you, Isabel, for that introduction. So my name is Hermit. I joined the UFM recently in the Brassica Genetics uh, program. Um, so, um, so today I want to talk something about how genomics can be leveraged to improve the current uh, programs for Brassica Genomics. Uh, so I thought this would be a perfect starting point for my talk. So this is a breeder's equation. It uh, very elegantly represents how uh, genetic gains uh, are represented within a breeding program. Every, every single component on that equation can be a, a thing in itself, but today I want to talk about the accuracy component. So in a breeding program, if you have more accuracy, you can get more genetic gain. But this accuracy, people have been trying to increase it by increasing the accuracy of genotyping or genotyping individuals. Well, what happens is when you start genotyping, uh, because genotyping is still expensive, so you can't you can't do it for many individuals, so your intensity goes down. So this accuracy has, if you want to really boost the genetic gains, you also have to uh, do innovations in type, types of phenotyping. We have been hearing about this a lot in terms of pre precision agriculture and, and other things. Uh, so for genotypings, most of the breeding programs use SNP arrays, and they have been working quite good. They are not very expensive. They, go, they give an overall idea about uh, the SNP calls at predefined locations in the genome, um, but they do have a problem. So uh, they don't represent structural variation. So Jakey Bately talked a lot about copy number variations and presence absence variations. So usually SNP arrays are, are a bit problematic in that area. Uh, before I dive into structural variation, I just want to give, I want to just set the context what I mean by structural variation. Uh, so on the top of the slide, you have a reference genome assembly and uh, anything, any genetic polymorphism which is greater than 50 base pairs is called structural variation in the literature. So you can have insertions, deletions, as, as Jake, Jackie talked about a lot, or copy number variations. Uh, but since we are in a, in a producer, breeder kind of conference, so why should we, uh, or how can we detect this very easily? So there are long read sequencing methodologies out there. I'm not going to go into detail how they work, but th there are two platforms out there which produce very long DNA reads, and these reads can uh, enable us to detect structural variations. Uh, but why should the breeders care? So this is the most important uh, question, like why should this community care about structural variations? A part of it has been underlined by the previous speakers. Uh, so if you see, so some of the examples I'm going to give here is, so, uh, so we detected structural variation in terms of 800 base pairs deletion in a lignin biosynthesis gene, which was associated with verticillium resistance, and, and this particular deletion could explain 19.4% uh, of the resistance uh, in Brassica napus. Another example I have here is flowering time, so uh, <clears throat> we detected 288 base pair deletion in flowering time locus T on chromosome A2, the lines which carried the deletion were flowering earlier than the lines which did not carry deletion. One thing I should underline here is it's, this is done in winter germplasm. So within the winter germplasm, we can still find uh, structural variations which contribute towards the flowering time. For the prediction side of things, so this graph shows you uh, genomic predictions for three different important diseases, black leg verticillium and uh, sclerotinia. And if we include structural variations uh, in the mo uh, models predicting uh, these genes, we can get 15 to 20 percent accuracy boost. So this will then again be translated into um, genetic gains. 
So moving on to the second part of my talk, phenotyping. So of course, genotyping is cool, we do it. Uh, but if we don't supplement it with phenotyping, these genetic gains would be very limited. So here I want to give you an example about challenges with phenotyping. I want to use verticillium longish perm resistance as, as an example. So traditionally, in a greenhouse type of setting, people how they screen for verticillium resistance is they go into the greenhouse, they uh, put the plants in a spore solution, and they put them back, and then you, you give them a score from a 0 to 9 rating, 0 being absolutely no symptoms, 9 being devastated. And then uh, they also have a field scoring system, so where uh, people measure the amount of microscarotia on the, on, the, on the plant and they give it a two or three, some kind of numbers. But here's a real world example. So this is the data I produced in Giesen. And then you measure these numbers over a period of time. So this is, you call it a AUDPC, area under disease progress curve. And you can see the red and blue color here represents the susceptible and resistant control. And as you can see, among 11 different screening rounds, uh, so every two graphs represent one screening round, and you can see these, these controls don't behave the same. In some of the screening round, the resistant control does look resistant, but in other, it does look more or less, more or less susceptible. So this gives you an idea that the phenotyping for quantitative disease resistance is not very simple, and, and it's, it's not very heritable. So there was a qPCR-based method out there for canola, which was already developed. Uh, so we wanted to deploy this method for phenotyping at very high scale. So I, don't want, I think everybody knows PCR after COVID. So, uh, so this is, uh, but this was done at, with four genotypes, but we wanted to do at 400 genotypes. Uh, so then, uh, so we started doing this. So we did this trial at two locations in Germany. We collected 16,000 stubbles, filled them in li these little plastic bags and transported them back to our university. Um, we do, did a lot of pre-processing. We uh, filled, these, them, filled the stubbles in these little bottles, freeze dried them and crushed them. Um, and did a qPCR, used some robots on the way, uh, and then we have graphs like this where if you, on the left side of the glass, uh, graph it's mostly uh, resistant genotypes, left side, uh, right side you have mostly uh, susceptible ones. And then um, the biggest challenge was the cost, so in a practical breeding program it, has, it can't cost that much, so by doing a lot of iterations and improving our method, we were able to bring down the cost to around three Canadian dollars per reaction. In a practical setting, $20,000 for one population with 250 lines screened across two populations. Compare that to the uh, COVID test. Last Yesterday I checked a COVID test still costs around 350 bucks. And we can still do it very similar technology for for three bucks. Yeah. So uh, some results from the qPCR method here. Uh, so if you look at this graph, we still got a decent correlation between the visual scoring and the qPCR, not very high, not very low. But the, the, the thing I want to underline here is if you look at the susceptible controls on this graph, most of the susceptible controls get a high disease rating, which is where they should be. And the qPCR also pointed out uh, more fungal biomass. But if you look at the resistant one, this is where the trouble starts. Most of the lines which were resistant were actually getting scores all over the place, but they were in, within the qPCR method, they were very low, they were carrying very low fungal biomass. The reason for this is the qPCR method really classifies the amount of fungus in the plant, whereas the visual scoring method might classify something as susceptible or more diseased based on other things which are happening on the field, senescence or a lot of other factors might play a role. Uh, so take home message from my talk would be <coughs> the genetic gains uh, can be maximized by increasing the accuracy of the phenotype and genotype. Structural variations are important and, and breeders should think about that, uh, this and, and try to into, uh, include them in their uh, marker, marker state programs. Uh, advances in phenotyping method as an example of this and we have heard it over the last two days would be very helpful in maximizing these genetic gains. And these genetic gains would then also be translated into real dollars at the end of the day. Uh, what I want to show is some of, because this is a, the theme of the day is innovation, so I want to show some innovations we did on the way where we were developing this system. So these little bottles you show are basically, we got them from a pharmaceutical supplier in Germany. Uh, 
So they, they, they uh, fill medicine into it. And the little steel beads you see on the slides, uh, the scientific companies do make them, but they are expensive. But these are like just ball bearings you will find in automobile or whatnot. And at the end, uh, I want to show you a method which uh, we developed, or a precision method which we developed to, to crush these stubbles so, to, so they are small enough to fit in these bottles. Uh, I hope the video will work and you'll see an awesome equipment in action. Uh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I think the, the, best is, the best method to do it is the simplest method. Yeah, with that, I think I'm, I'm at the end of my talk. I would like to acknowledge uh, some people here, uh, uh, Professor Rod Snowden and Christian Obermeyer from University of Gießen and our collaborators in University of Göttingen who were doing the pathology work. Uh, because this work was done in Germany, so a lot of companies were involved in it. Some of the names of the companies, I think, might have changed by now, but that's how they were when I did the work. So anyways, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks very much. It's funny, yesterday I commented to a colleague that I thought some of the producers had much you know, better tech than we do in the lab, and there was the example of what, what we do have going on. So um, our next speaker, again, this is pre-recorded, which uh, one of our colleagues in France kindly did. And this is Melanie Jubalt from INRA. And she is talking about a very different form of variation that can actually contribute to changes in traits. And that is methylation variation. So she is an associate professor in genomics, epigenomics, and plant breeding at INRA in France. And uh, she is studying like, additional changes to the DNA that can impact um, traits, in particular disease resistance and also modulation of abiotic stresses in Braska. I think I might be ready to go. Perfect. I miss the opportunity to present the results obtained in my lab at INRAE of Friends. This result deals with the identification of naturally and induced stable epi variations involved in quantitative partial resistance to club root in Arabidopsis. The main investigators of this work are two PhD students, Benjamin Légar and Mathilde Petitba, under the supervision of Antoine Graveau, Maria manzanares Dole, and myself. The mostly used definition of epigenetics is a study of mitotically and or meiotically irritable changes in gene expression that cannot be explained by changes in DNA sequences. The epigenome orchestrates genome accessibility and functionality, in particular thanks to cytosine methylation and histone modification. Several recent studies so show that natural populations present extensive DNA variation as well as methylation variations, and that, unlike mammals, plants appear to be prone to transgenerational epigenetics. That is to say that some epigenetic variations are stable or metastable and transmitted to the next generation without resetting. However, only a little number of natural APLLs are described, with the most famous one, Peloric in uh, Lenaria, and the epimutant CNR in Tomato Liberty, to Liberto, sorry, <coughs> and the question of the relative contribution of epimutation and DNA mutation to phenotypic variation is not yet resolved. In my lab, we are studying the response of Brassica CAE to pathogen, and in particular to club root. Club root caused by the protist Plasmodiophora brassicae is a worldwide major disease of brassicaceae, included the three most economically important brassica species, brassica napus, brassica rapa, brassica oleracea, and uh, it also infects the model plants Arabidopsis taliana. Plasmodiophora brassicae Infection leads to tumorous club formation on roots, resulting from cell hyperplasia and hypertrophy. In a previous screening done in the lab, an accession bio zero had been identified as partially resistant to isolate EH of plasmodiophora brassicae 
as you can see, compared to uh, the susceptible, susceptible accession, called zero, where the roots are nearly turned into a goal. Partial resistance was associated with a slow development of root goal, a lower amount of pathogen in infected roots tissue, and a reduced impact on leaf development. The genetic determinism of this resistance was thereafter analysed in a recombinant in bread lines progeny and had led to the identification of far additive QTL and among them the resistance QTL PB at PB at 5.2 sorry displayed a medium effect with uh, an explanation of uh, phenotypic uh, variation of around 20. Among the recombinant in red line sets, one real line displayed a single residual heterozygous regions, including the QTL confidence interval. Heterogeneous in red family lines have been derived from this real by selfing. And the, those two near heterogenic lines then harbor identical combination of resistance and susceptible homozygous genome sequences at every loci, except in the region of the QTL, where they are homozygous for resistance or susceptible alleles. HIF lines with a resistant allele displayed a higher level of partial resistance to EH isolate compared to HIF lines with susceptible allele, thus correlating the position of the QTL in this interval. HIF were further challenged with several additional plasmodiophora CK isolate, and uh, as you can see, the resistance HIF shows for every isolate less symptoms than the susceptible one, highlighting the broad spectrum of the partial resistance conferred by the resistance as this locus. We then started to create a fine mapping population from crosses between uh, HIF and uh, we used uh, the 3,000 lines to reduce the QTL interval of confidence. The resistance locus was fine mapped for several rounds of genotyping and club root phenotyping, resist resulting in a final uh, confidence interval of 27, 26 kilobase, which contained 8 annotated open reading frames, six transposons, and one long non-coding RNA. To facilitate the identification of uh, the causal gene, an RSEC analysis was performed in roots of the resistance and susceptible accession. The genes 1 and 2 show similar expression pattern in non-infected and infected plants between resistant and susceptible individuals, but displayed numerous nucleotidic variations. However, club root symptoms were not different from CAL0 in their corresponding homozygous tDNA mutant lines, invalidating thus the idea that short genes may drive club root susceptibility in, in CAL0. So. No transcripts uh, were found for gen genes 5 and 6, and uh, genes 7 and 8 were both nearly uh, devoid of uh, nucleotidic variations, to the exception of two in their promoter regions, uh, respectively. But the possible uh, causal role of this variation was discarded as those genes were expressed at similar levels, whatever the presence of resistance or susceptible alleles. So genes 3 and 4, which are NLR uh, immune receptor genes, display only one single uh, non-synonymous uh, SNP and no SNP respectively. However, the RNA-seq analysis indicated that the genes were constitutively expressed in the roots of resistant accession, but uh, were not detectable in susceptible accession. So the functional significance of the, these two genes in club root resistance was then addressed by generating knockout lines via CRISPR-Cas9 technology, targeting the region coding the uh, NBARC domain of both genes in resistant pure zero accession. The CRISPR-Cas9 
generated mutation gave rise to premature stop codons or mutated proteins, and we found that the global symptoms for all the edited lines that you can see here were significantly higher than in the wild type resistant pure zero accession and similar to the susceptible accession called zero, confirming that both genes are involved in club root resistance. Then, to understand why these two genes were significantly differentially expressed between the parents, we analyzed the methylation level of these two genes using the public bisulfate data from 1001 genomes. The genomic interval of 8 kilobase, including the candidate genes, was highly metadated in the free context in uh, CoL0, the susceptible parents, and associated with the low expressions of the two genes. Whereas in the Bure, in Bure 0 in the resistant parents, the region was poorly methylated and associated with a high expression of uh, the two genes. This contrasted methylation state between the two accessions was experimentally confirmed in our laboratory in both in a non-infected and infected condition. Altogether, those results suggest a strong link between partial resistance to plasmodiophora brassicae and a stably inherited epi variation, which controls the expression of two genes as this locus. The role uh, in, of this AP variation in the control of club root resistance was further investigated by relying on the natural distribution of the methylation statue for the eight KB regions across natural Arabidopsis accession using the 1001 genome data. We found first that the resistance APLL is more frequent than the susceptible, and uh, we confirm the sharp negative correlation between methylation level and gene expression for the region. We then investigated in the collection the possibility that cheese genomic sequence variation could be behind the epi mutation. If you remember, I said that there was a SNP in the coding sequence of the first gene and no SNP then. Uh, however, we identify five accessions which abort a sequence strictly identical to susceptible parents in the region and with a pattern like resistance uh, methylation, a uh, methylation pattern like pure zero, demonstrating that this SNP is not the primary driver of the methylation pattern. Finally, uh, a selection of 127 accessions uh, included 42 succession with the susceptible APLL and 84 succession with the resistant APLL were inoculated with the plasmodiophora brassica and EH isolate. This experiment shows that low methylation state and gene expression of the reagent was correlated to an enhanced partial resistance confirming that we have identified a club root resistance locus confirmed, controlled by a natural epimutation. We then wanted to determine to what extent epimutation could control loci involved in club root resistance. Is uh, epimutation a previously described is an isolated case, or can we imagine more epimutations controlling club root resistance? So for that, we use the epiril population derived from the cross between col zero, here, yeah, which is susceptible to club root, and uh, a mutant DDM1, which is partially resistant to club root. DDM1 is a gene which is involved in the methylation maintenance. So uh, the epiril at the end have a similar uh, genomic sequence, except for a few transpositions, but different epigenomes, which are a mosaic of uh, epigen parents' epigenome. Colo Labs develop an epigenetic map on 133 of this epiril population, using as markers differentially methylated regions stable across generations. So in the lab, we just phenotype this population after infection with a club root and uh, to determine the genomic region under epigenetic variation controlling uh, club root resistance. 
So epiperial population, as you can see, display a wide range of phenotypes after club root uh, infection, from more resistant to DDM1 to more susceptible uh, than uh, COL0. And we perform QTL epidet. In total, uh, we detected uh, 16 epigenetic QTL uh, gathered in six genomic regions. Some regions are completely new for us, but some co-localize with uh, the genetic factors already identified as uh, in club root resistance, in particular on chromosome one, um, uh, with, with, um, where we have a tight co-location uh, of the QTLs, the APQTLs, and the RPB1, a club root major re resistance uh, gene previously identified. So these results res confirm that resistance to club root could be controlled by epi mutations and uh, open uh, the opportunity that uh, epi mutation could be considered as diversity for pretty. So we have shown that epigenetics can be involved in our abidopsis resistance to club root, but as we can see every day, climate changes entails more punctual heat waves, flooding and drought, and in the lab, we are now interested with in the environmental impact on club root resistance, and in particular, club root resistance controlled by epi mutation. We are uh, interested in particular uh, with the impact of soil hydro status and temperature rise on the resistance. So this is the subject of Mathilde Petitpa work, who is currently doing a PhD in our lab. So our question now is, what is the impact of environmental changes on the club root resistance controlled by EP mutation? Is the effect of club root resistance epigenetic QTL maintained regardless of environmental conditions? To assess such impact, we have phenotyped the epiril population under contrasting abiotic condition, applied a seven day uh, after infection with plasmodium for Abacicae and during seven days. So the stress applied, the abiotic stress applied, are a rise of five degrees a uh, night and day and uh, moderate drought or, or flood. And then we perform uh, QTL uh, detection. We are still analyzing the results, but in, in total, we have detected 28 epiQTLs for the four growth condition with a strong co-localization of the QTL epigenetic on chromosome ones, one and five, on chromosome one, sorry, and five. Most regions are maintained in at least two conditions, but some of them are specific of an abiotic condition. So we are now investigating uh, what entails uh, the changes in the effect of epigenetic QTLs under the different abiotic condition. Are these changes due to methylation level variation at the QTL, or are they due to modification in the signaling and metabolic pathway classically involved in global resistance? To finish the take-home message, we have highlighted epigenetically driven expression polymorphisms, which contribute to the natural diversity of quantitative response to a plant pathogen. With the identification of two neighboring NLR immune receptors regulated by a natural epigenetic variation that control partial resistance to club root, and the identification of induced epimutations controlling club root resistance loci. In this work, all the identified APLLs are stable, that is to say that they are stably transmitted for the generations. In this work, we have also uh, shown that club root resistance is dependent on environmental conditions, and we are now investigating the involvement of epigenetic regulations uh, in these changes. I have already cited the main investigators, Benjamin, Mathilde, Antoine, Christine, Maria, and I also found Jocelyn and the DB team at IGEP. Lastly, this work has been done in collaboration with Vincent Colo and Leandro Quadrana at IPENS. Thank you very much for your attention.
Um, so the final speaker of our session is Steve Wyatt from University of Manitoba again. And he is a professor in the Department of Biological Sciences, um, focusing on molecular biology of insect development. And he's going to be talking about a pretty exciting area of um, controlling insects in plants, which is using RNAi for controlling canola pests. Yes. All right. Good morning, everyone, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me to give you an overview of our RNA technologies to control pests and pathogens in canola. And it's not working. There we go. <laughs> all right. Um, like all other crops, canola is plagued with a host of pests and pathogens. These five on the screen are the ones that we are currently studying. Today, I'm only going to talk about two of them, the flea beetles and the sclerotinia fungus. Most of the controls that we are employing are use, using chemical pesticides, and they are fantastic when they work, but there are two serious problems that we have with them. Firstly, there is increasing resistance of pesticides in the environment, which forces us to use more or switch to new ones. And then there are those off-target effects that are effect adversely affecting the beneficial species or non-target species. So we are trying to develop a new generation of pesticides, double-stranded RNA pesticides. They have a few features that are rather unique and I think uh, a considerable benefit to the, um, the industries. First, they are species-specific. I'll go into that in a moment. They're also biodegradable. When they hit the soil, the soil microbes are able to degrade them quickly. And if you have a platform to make double-stranded RNA pesticides, it is very easy for you to adapt or switch to a new sequence and to prepare a different double-stranded RNA to either target a different insect or pest or a resistant one. So the real appeal to double-stranded RNA pesticides is the fact that they can be species-specific. And this is relying on the fact that all species are unique based on their unique gene sequences. And so what we're effectively doing is targeting those unique sequences by preparing double-stranded RNAs to target those messenger RNAs derived from those genes. And if we can select a gene that is critical for the insect or pest, then we can selectively kill that pest beetle and not adversely affect the beneficial honeybee. So how does it work? Well, all eukaryotic cells have mechanisms to take up double-stranded RNA. I won't get into the details. I'm happy to answer those questions later. But once the double-stranded RNA gets into the cell, it is diced up into short interfering RNAs, where it is then co-opted by a group of proteins called RISC, which then is where the magic happens. It actually can scan the entire repertoire of messenger RNAs within the cell when it finds a sequence that is complementary to the siRNA, it will then target that messenger RNA for destruction, thereby silencing that gene's expression, hence the term gene silencing or RNA interference. When we're going to apply double-stranded RNA to plants, we have to think about various modalities of delivery. This particular figure is looking a little bit busy, but it, this represents all of the various methods that we have actually tried in, in delivering double-stranded RNAs to plants, ranging from formulations that are for foliar sprays to root uptake to even seed treatments that we're now trying. And we're also trying transgenic approaches. So that little red bar on, off to the left is representing um, that realm of where the plant will make the double-stranded RNA to protect itself from the pest or pathogen. So what I'd like to do now is talk about our progress with the flea beetles. So we have, I guess, the luxury, if you can say that, of being able to go out in the field and collecting them by the tens of thousands bringing them into the lab, and fortunately my colleagues are much better than me at being able to raise them in lab colonies, but we are able to sequence both species, both the striped and the crucifer beetles, at different developmental stages and sexes to develop transcriptomes that we could then look for sequences that are unique to the flea beetles that are not found in other species. 
We then would develop double-stranded RNAs for them, spot them onto leaf discs, feed them to the beetles, and then assess mortality and leaf consumption. We've now screened over 100 different double-stranded RNAs with flea beetles. What you can see in the top graph is the mortality of the beetles over a course of, sadly, two weeks. So yes, it will kill them, but it takes two weeks. That does not sound too good, uh, can, given that most chemical pesticides can kill in a matter of minutes or days. But what is good news is that when we look at their feeding activity, we see that their appetite is suppressed almost after one day of feeding, and the leaf damage is considerably reduced. This figure shows the first 50-odd number of, of double-stranded RNAs that we've examined, with the far left showing the most potent double-stranded RNAs creating the greatest mortality. What we find is that the most effective target double-stranded RNAs are those that are targeting genes that are expressed in gut, because after all, the insects are consuming the double-stranded RNA, and genes that are moderately expressed, because highly expressed genes are hard to knock down, and also constitutively expressed genes, steady state genes, rather than genes that can be inducible and possibly override the double-stranded RNA. What you see in the middle of that graph, though, are a lot of double-stranded RNAs that are doing something, but not maybe enough to be useful. So can we do anything with them? And the answer is yes. If we combine them, we can actually get additive or even synergistic effects. So we can go from 60% mortality with a single double-stranded RNA to 100% mortality if we do the right pairwise combinations. And we've identified a number of those pairwise combinations that give us this effect. We've also worked on the actual double-stranded RNA molecule itself. What you see here is a stabilized paperclip molecule. It has closed ends, which means that it's now protected from the gut nucleases within the insect gut. But more interestingly, it has a different mechanism of uptake into the cells than the linear molecules. And that will be particularly important in those species where uptake is a limiting factor. And there are indeed some species that show that behavior. And finally, we need to improve on our formulations. If we're going to take this to the field, we're going to have to be aware of the environmental conditions and find um, molecules that will help that double-stranded RNA in the environment. Here I'm showing you a, a, uh, sorry, a, a cellulose microcarrier that is showing improved uh, adhesion to the leaves. So even when we wash the leaves, the double-stranded RNA will stick to the leaf, um, almost co comparable levels to uh, an unwashed leaf. So we've now compared a couple of different nanoparticles as delivery modes for the flea beetles. The cellulose-based microcarrier on the right is showing really good efficacy in terms of there is very little damage to those uh, seedlings, and we are able to kill the beetles more effectively than the double-stranded RNA alone. In contrast, this bioclay nanoparticle that has been produced in Australia and has worked very nicely in some conditions was of no use to us with flea beetles. In fact, it was somewhat worse. Uh, the flea beetles thrived. You look at the low, lower panel on the left, you'll see that they are surviving just as effectively as the untreated controls, and they have completely decimated those seedlings. So now the big question comes, is it really affordable? Can you possibly make enough double-stranded RNA to be used as a foliar spray? Certainly in the laboratory, when we're making small quantities of many different double-stranded RNAs, it's extremely expensive, but we're only making small quantities, so it's doable. We can also use microorganisms to mass-produce double-stranded RNA, and we do that in our lab to at least get the costs considerably down. But there are commercial producers now that are able to make large quantities of the double-stranded RNA, such that they can apply these um, at an affordable cost across an entire field. In fact, Greenlight Biosciences has now produced a product that they will get registered next year for use against um, Colorado potato beetle using a foliar spray. All right, I'd like to turn now to our efforts with sclerotinia fungus. This is a necrotrophic fungus that is um, particularly um, tenacious and able to destroy a plant very quickly. Here we're looking at leaves that are only three days old after infection. The one on the right is showing how quickly the plant is succumbing to the fungus, whereas the leaf on the left, you can see that there is a tiny little lesion. This leaf has been previously sprayed with double-stranded RNA and has suppressed the uh, growth of the fungus effectively. So when we are looking at control of sclerotinia, we're taking two approaches, transgenics and foliar sprays. 
The transgenics have that distinct advantage of being able to provide that protection all the time. Of course, they also have the trouble of public perceptions in certain jurisdictions, and then there are the regulatory delays in getting it processed. Foliar sprays, on the other hand, are easily uh, moved from one crop to the other, and sclerotinia, for example, targets lots of crops, so it could be sprayed on many different crops without making transgenics. Of course, it's got the distinct disadvantage of being on the leaf and possibly washed off or blown off the leaves, and so you may have to do multiple applications, so the cost may go up. So again, like the flea beetles, we have screened over 100 double-stranded RNAs for sclerotinia. We use those leaf-based assays to initially identify those double-stranded RNAs that are effective. So this graph shows um, the strongest through to the weakest, moving from left to right. And what we're able then to do is take those double-stranded RNAs and apply them to an entire plant and show that it is indeed protected from the fungus. But more interestingly, I think, is that we have been able to make transgenic plants. And what you can see in the top left is some um, control plants that have been infected seven days post-infection. Those plants are looking pretty sickly. They've lost most of their leaves and flowers and are you know, slowly dying. The transgenic plants, in contrast, also sprayed with the, double, uh, with the fungus, are still thriving. And when we look at the micrographs below, we see that in the negative controls, the fungus is deeply embedded in that matrix inside the core of the stem. But in the transgenic plants, those stems are looking healthy. There's very little fungus to be detected. And in fact, the plant has now had time to develop some secondary protection mechanisms that are highlighted in that figure that I'll talk about later if you're interested. And on that graph on the right, what we're seeing is that Yes, the leaf lesions are um, reduced in the transgenics. The number of sclerotia are also reduced, but more importantly, the seed yield has gone up substantially in those plants. We got a good yield of seed that was actually comparable to an uninfected plant. All right, so we're not done yet, um, but we're done funding from um, this agency, so see ya. <laughs> but um, I'll be talking to, uh, well, we've already been talking to other people about how to support our research. So these are the other things that are still ongoing. We are testing the foliar formulations to see if we can get better durability. We're looking now at penetrance and adherence. We're also looking at seed treatments for the flea beetles because we recognize we need to hit them as soon as those things are germinating and we need to replace those neonics. And we are also now in the midst of comparing our foliar versus our transgenics. So we've made some transgenic plants and now we're going to do direct side-by-side -side comparisons of a foliar versus transgenic. And lastly, we do have to get out to the field to really test these and prove to everybody that this really does work. Um, so. The main points, um, first of all, RNAi is a species-specific mechanism of control, and the ag chem companies are very much intrigued with it, as is the public. I know that the growers would like to probably see that we produce a product that can con control every pest, but you can, in fact, mix and match the double-stranded RNAs easier to be able to do, achieve that. We can protect the plants either with foliar sprays or by transgenic methods, which we are doing both to satisfy different markets. But we still need to get those field trials done, and thankfully, we at least have a sponsor that will be helping us with the field trials in the next year or two. And with that, I would just like to thank my team, and I work very closely with Mark Belmonte, with whom I imagine many of you know. Um, and together, we have been very successful in getting this program going. We're extending it into many different directions, including those other species that you saw on the first slide. There are my funding agencies, which without, we could not have done all these interesting things. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Sorry. Just going to ask Harmeet to come back on stage. Um, and then I don't know whether we, we have any questions from the audience. I don't see a thing. Any from the online at the moment? If you are online, please remember to um, put your questions into the Q&A, otherwise we can't obviously answer them. I, I actually have a question. So with the RNAi, does it, does it, with the flea beetle, you, I mean, it's species specific, but does it target both, all, all, both types of flea beetles? 
So we can make double-stranded RNAs that are effective against both species. There are a number of genes that are highly conserved. What you're looking for is a conserved 21 nucleotide sequence. And yeah. Yeah. All right, sorry. So to answer, the, the question was, can we make double-stranded RNAs that affect both species of flea beetles? And the answer is yes. Uh, for some genes, there is enough uh, conservation of those sequences that we can find a conserved 21 nucleotide length to make those siRNAs effective. But interestingly, we have also made a lot of okay. double-stranded RNAs that will kill one and not the other. That's not what we want to market, but it was a nice uh, piece of evidence to show that there really is specificity if you want it. So we can do both ways, but understandably we will probably be making it so that it's generically effective against both. We do have some questions from the online. Uh, top question is, this is, uh, this is for Steve, this is very excellent work. Have you seen any pushback so far from the antibiotic crowd? <laughs> antibiotic crowd, well. <laughs> uh, no, but then, you know, I'm not maybe putting myself out there as much as the um, companies that are trying to sell this. So right now there are two RNAi protect protection products out there. Bear Crop Science has got their um, corn with um, a SNF7 double-stranded RNA to control corn rootworm. And they haven't received too much um, pushback yet. And Greenlight Biosciences is now going through regulatory approvals. And interestingly, they have not seen much pushback either. I'm hoping, maybe this is incorrectly, but I'm hoping that everybody's awareness of RNA technologies from the vaccines that we've all had to endure have at least educated people on what does RNA look like? What does it possibly do? And so it's a little less scary. And so when we are telling them that we're going to use an RNA-based pesticide, it's in effect, it's not a vaccine, but it is still a protection molecule, much like what they have just had injected into them, and they're doing fine, <laughs> by and large. <laughs> I'm not a doctor. <laughs> well, I am a doctor, but disappointingly not the kind of doctor that my wife wanted me to be. <laughs> And I guess another question would be, is there enough knowledge and information about beneficial insects to be sure that you can say that you're actually targeting the, the uh, bad ones without damaging the good ones? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And um, I didn't show some of our work, but we have gone to the field and collected a bunch of other insects that are in that agrosystem. And we have injected them with large doses of the double-stranded RNA to kill the flea beetle to see if it would adversely affect the non-target species. And the great news is the answer is no. So you can do that the hard way, as we did. You can also use bioinformatics as a tool to at least tell you that there is no sequence within the honeybee genome, so they should be fine. But the regulators are not happy with that should be. They, they want confirmation, so we are still obliged to have to test those non-target species. But the bioinformatics really can help you inform us on whether the sequence looks like it's elsewhere. Of course, not every species has been sequenced yet, so the database is only as good as it is. Um. With the, the context of methylation, I'm kind of intrigued, but the long read technologies allows you to also look at methylation at the same time as you're sequencing. Do you think there's any way of sort of quantifying that type of variation in the context of traits and its utility? Uh, you mean? Hello. Yeah, it's good. Oh, OK. Uh, you mean context of structural variations? Well, yeah, because is there a, can we tie it all together? I think there is a paper in RISE from, I think, Jakey Bailey's group. Uh, which which kind of looks into that direction, but at that time they did bisulfite sequencing uh, because nanopore was not that popular. Um, um, and then I think they f they found that um, the areas with structural variations had lower lower uh, methylation around them. So of course I think uh, 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 longer read technologies would help to to tie both of the concepts together. I mean people have been also looking at 
other kind of genomic elements like promoters and all. Yeah, and especially uh, with nanopore, uh, where you can detect the methylation without without any much work. So I think this is a good good area of uh, exploration. Is Melanie online for questions? Is Melanie online? Okay. You should be able to sit. the question is after the meeting, and you should be able to get a response. Okay, so. Most of the questions are aimed at Steve, <laughs> and they usually begin with beautiful research, Steve. Um, the, the next one in the, the top list is, has there been thought to how quickly the wild population might adapt if the kill isn't 100%? And that's a great question. So certainly if you are delivering a sublethal dose, you are running the risk of having um, some semi-resistant individuals survive and then propagate a resistance allele through the population. So those studies have been underway in some labs. For the corn rootworm, they have, there are a couple of labs that have now generated resistant corn rootworm to double-stranded RNA, which I think is evil. We barely got started. <laughs> and they, they're already making them resistant. But I understand why they did that, um, to understand the mechanism of resistance. And interestingly, the resistance is due to uptake, reduced uptake. So the cells will not take up the double-stranded RNA. And so what I'm really excited about here, I'm gonna sell my technology, but the paperclip RNAs that we're working on are able to bypass that uptake mechanism and enter the cells. So we have been able to deliver double-stranded RNA into moths, and moths are typically refractory to double-stranded RNA. You need big doses to kill them, but that's because of uptake problems and release of the RNA into the cytoplasm. The paperclip, for some reason that we're still trying to explore mechanistically how, is getting into the cytoplasm and mediating our RNA interference. So we could overcome that resistance. I'm not recommending we start with that molecule. Um, we start with the rec conventional linear molecules, but resistance is likely going to rise. Let's face it, nature always becomes resistant to whatever we throw at it. Can I, can I add on something? Uh, so can't you just target a different gene? So if, if it becomes resistance, you just target another critical gene in their pathway? Certainly you can. If, if there, there's resistance in the population due to a uh, sequence difference, and that's likely going to occur, then you have other genes that you can throw at it. What we're worried about is that last example, though, where resistance, it was resistance to all double-stranded RNA because nothing was getting in. Then we got a problem, and that's where I'm hoping our, at least our alternative technologies can help. It doesn't have to be mine. It can also be any carrier that drives the double-stranded RNA into the cell bypassing that uptake mechanism. Uh, thank you. I, I do have another question. Like with, with COVID vaccines, like they used to transport that, them in minus 80 degrees with frozen mRNA. How would you transport this to the field? No, we can ship it on ice um, and we just, do, um, it will, it's stable. Double-stranded RNA is more stable than single-stranded RNA. Single-stranded RNA gets degraded very quickly. Double-stranded RNA, on a leaf will last two weeks. As long as it's dry, it's gonna stay there. It's when it rains that it will wash off unless we've got some kind of adherent. But it is much more stable, so we can ship it, even at room temperature. We've kept on, on um, at room temperature for days and it's still effective. Thanks. Okay, maybe, have we got one more and then probably- We, we have quite time. a lot more. Oh, still, well. still going for Steve. <laughs> well, okay, just one more, I think. One they more, got me okay. For the day. <laughs> Um, actually, there's a one right at the bottom. Is um, perhaps we can have your thoughts on off-target problems or opportunities with using RNAi approaches. In terms in terms of off-targets, what we try to do is first of all pick genes that are unique to the pest insect where possible. We also try to pick genes that are insect specific so that we're not running into any other trophic levels that might have a, a shared gene sequence. But when we're picking um, sequences, we are intentionally looking for where there is no shared 21 mer or 21 nucleotide length. And as long as we've done that job well, we do not see cross silencing. Interestingly, it can sometimes take only a single 21 nucleotide sequence though to have some cross reactivity with 
another gene. So if two genes share the same 21 nucleotides, it's possible that it too could be knocked down. Then you got to think about, well, what is the exposure? Uh, would that other organism actually acquire that? So I don't think I have to worry about the South American tree frogs sequences. I have to worry about what's going on locally. And I think we do owe it to the regulators to understand what's the what's the variation of species within the agrosystem and what uh, sequences might they share. Okay, so, oh yeah, sorry. Okay, I'd just like to thank all the speakers. Unfortunately, two of them were pre-recorded, as I mentioned, but if you do have questions, then um, uh, please send them in and we'll get them answered for you. And we have, um, we, there is a donation given oh, to good. the Keith Downey Undergraduate Scholarship in your Liu, but Good. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.